Hi everyone, today we will talk about parallel transport and the Gauss-Bonnet theorem. When we have a surface sigma and a smooth curve gamma in our surface, the parallel transport along gamma is a linear map from the tangent plane to sigma at the initial point of the curve to the tangent plane at the final point of the curve. It is obtained by sliding such tangent plane along the curve with as little rotation as possible. It is defined as follows. Let P and Q be the initial and final points of gamma, and take a vector W0 in Tp sigma. We would like to construct a vector field W along gamma that starts at W0 and its covariant derivative along gamma is 0. We then define P gamma of W0 to be W evaluated at the final time. It turns out such vector field exists and is unique. To see this, assume the curve gamma is covered by a coordinate chart. This allows us to write W as a linear combination of SU and SV. Then, the condition of W having zero covariant derivative along gamma becomes a linear first-order ordinary differential equation with smooth coefficients. By the classic theory of such equations, the desired vector field W exists and is unique. In the case the curve gamma is not covered by a single coordinate chart, we can break it into pieces in such a way that each piece is covered by a coordinate chart and consider the parallel transport along each piece separately, proving the proposition in general. Notice that this trick also allows us to define parallel transport along curves that are only piecewise smooth. A vector field like the one constructed in this proposition is called parallel. Next thing we prove is that the parallel transport is an isometry. This proof turns out to be extremely simple. Take W0 in Tp sigma and consider the parallel vector field W that begins at W0. By the product rule, the derivative of its length squared is given by 2 times the dot product between W and its derivative W prime. Since the covariant derivative of W is 0, this means that W prime is perpendicular to the surface, in particular, perpendicular to W meaning that this dot product is zero. This computation implies that the length of W is independent of time, implying that the parallel transport is an isometry. In particular, if gamma is a closed curve, the parallel transport along gamma is a rotation of the plane tangent to sigma at the base point of gamma. We now deal with the problem of computing the angle of such rotation. Recall that the geodesic curvature of a smooth unit speed curve gamma in a surface is defined by the following formula measuring how much is the curve bending. Positive where it is bending left and negative where it is bending right. With this, we define the total geodesic curvature of gamma to be the integral of this quantity. Just like we did with total signed curvature in lesson 7, we can also define the total geodesic curvature of a piecewise smooth curve as the sum of the total geodesic curvatures of the smooth pieces plus the angles of rotation at the corners, counted with positive sign when the curve turns left and with negative sign when the curve turns right. In case gamma is closed, we then also include the angle at the base point. It turns out that for a piecewise smooth curve gamma on a surface sigma, the parallel transport along gamma is precisely the clockwise rotation by angle the total geodesic curvature of gamma. To prove this, first assume the closed curve gamma is a concatenation of geodesics. Let x be the parallel vector field along gamma with x of a equals gamma prime. Since parallel transport is an isometry, the signed angle from gamma prime to x is constant along the smooth pieces and at each corner it changes by an amount equal to minus the angle of rotation at such corner. Summing over all corners, x of b, which is the parallel transport of x of a, is obtained as a clockwise rotation by angle psi of gamma of gamma prime at a, which equals x of a. This proves the proposition in the case when gamma is a concatenation of geodesics. Now assume gamma is a closed smooth curve and again let x be the parallel vector field with x of a the initial velocity of gamma. Also consider y the counterclockwise rotation of x by 90 degrees. Notice that y also has zero covariant derivative and it is given by n cross x where n is the normal vector field. Then we write gamma prime as a linear combination of x and y. As gamma is parametrized by arc length, 
gamma prime has length 1 and it can be written as cos of theta times x plus sine of theta times y for some smooth function theta defined on the interval a b with theta of a equals 0. We claim that the geodesic curvature is given by theta prime. This is a very simple computation. First, we notice that n cross gamma prime equals cos of theta times y minus sine of theta times x. Also, using the prolog rule a couple of times, gamma prime prime is given by cos of theta times x prime plus sine of theta times y prime plus cos of theta y minus sine of theta x multiplied by theta prime. Here's where we use the fact that both x and y have zero covariant derivative, meaning that x prime and y prime are both perpendicular to sigma, so perpendicular to both x and y. Simplifying the dot product, the geodesic curvature is theta prime. Integrating this, we conclude that the total geodesic curvature equals theta of b. Then we notice that at final time, p gamma of the initial velocity is a clockwise rotation of the initial velocity by angle theta of b, finishing the proof of the proposition when gamma is a closed smooth curve. The general case when gamma is a piecewise smooth curve is obtained by a combination of the two cases we considered and I leave it to you as an exercise. Now we are ready to talk about the gauss bonnet formula. It states that if we have a region R in a surface homeomorphic to a disk bounded by a piecewise smooth curve, then the integral of the Gauss curvature over R plus the total geodesic curvature of its boundary equals 2 pi, where we consider its boundary as being traveled with R on its left. This is a generalization of a theorem we proved in lesson 7, the theorem of turning tangents, the hope whom loves us. In the two-dimensional plane, for a simple closed curve traveling with the region it surrounds on its left, its total sine curvature equals 2 pi. To prove the gauss bonnet formula, we will prove first a weaker version. This lemma says that the expression on the left-hand side of the gauss bonnet formula is a multiple of 2 pi. Our plan is as follows. We first show that the lemma holds for small enough regions, then that the lemma holds for general regions. Then we show that the theorem holds for small enough regions, and then we prove the formula in full generality. The first step is going to be a simple computation in semi-geodesic charts using the Jacobi equation we proved last lesson. The third step is obtained by deforming a curved region into a flat one to which we can apply the Umlov sats, and finally, the second and fourth steps consist of simple patching arguments. Before we go into these four steps, we need to prove one more thing. Assume that we have a closed piecewise smooth curve gamma on a surface and the unit vector field x along gamma with x of b equals x of a. Define y to be the counterclockwise rotation of x by 90 degrees. Then the integral along gamma of the dot product of x prime with y equals the total geodesic curvature of gamma modulo 2 pi. The proof of this proposition is very similar to the one of the previous one, so we will only gloss over it. Construct two parallel vector fields x bar and y bar along gamma with the same initial values as x and y. Write x as cos theta x bar plus sine theta y bar. Then the dot product between x prime and y equals theta prime. So the integral of the proposition equals theta of b. Therefore, theta of b is the angle of clockwise rotation of the parallel transport along gamma, which by the previous proposition is precisely the total geodesic curvature of gamma. This finishes the proof of the proposition. Notice that since we are talking about rotations, the equality of angles only holds up to a multiple of 2 pi. Now we go to step 1 in the proof of the gauss bonnet formula. We take a region R as in the lemma and assume it is so small that it can be covered by a semi-geodesic chart S. Semi-geodesic charts come with a function b given by the length of Sv. Since SU has length 1 and is perpendicular to SV, the Jacobian of a semi-geodesic chart S is also given by B. Also recall the Jacobi equation and the identities we proved last lesson, where X and Y are the unit vectors in the directions of SU and SV respectively. Then the integral of the Gauss curvature over R is given by the integral of BK over S inverse of R. By the Jacobi equation, this is minus the integral of BUU. Then, by the Green-Stokes theorem, this is minus the integral of BU dV along the boundary curve of S inverse of R. 
By the identities above, this can be rewritten as xu dot y du plus xv dot y dv. By the previous proposition, this equals the total geodesic curvature of gamma modulo 2 pi, concluding step 1. Now we move on to step 2. For this purpose, for a region R as in the theorem, we denote by gb of R the expression in the left-hand side of the Gauss-Bonnet formula minus 2 pi. We have proven in step 1 that if R is covered by a semi-geodesic chart, then gb of R is 0 modulo 2 pi. Next thing we show is that if R can be separated into two regions R1 and R2 by cutting along a simple arc alpha, then GB of R equals GB of R1 plus GB of R2. To prove this proposition, let gamma1 and gamma2 be the portions of the boundary of R shared with R1 and R2 respectively. Without loss of generality, we can assume alpha has R1 on its left and R2 on its right as in the picture. Also, let theta1, theta2, theta3, theta4 be the angles labeled in the picture. Then, the total geodesic curvature of the boundary of R1 is psi of gamma1 plus psi of alpha plus pi minus theta1 plus pi minus theta2. Similarly, the total geodesic curvature of the boundary of R2 is psi of gamma2 minus psi of alpha plus pi minus theta3 plus pi minus theta4. Finally, the total curvature of the boundary of R is psi of gamma 1 plus psi of gamma 2 plus pi minus theta 1 minus theta 3 plus pi minus theta 2 minus theta 4. Matching terms, we obtain that psi of the boundary of R equals psi of the boundary of R1 plus psi of the boundary of R2 minus 2 pi. From here, the additivity proposition follows as the integral of k over R is the sum of the integrals over R1 and R2. With this additivity property, step 2 comes quite easily. For a region R as in lemma, we can break it into small pieces in such a way that each piece is covered by a semi-geodesic chart. By step 1, gb of each piece is 0 modulo 2 pi, and then using the additivity property, gb of the entire region is also 0 modulo 2 pi, concluding step 2. Now we are in business to prove the gauss bonnet formula. First assume the region R is contained in a portion of the surface that is the graph of a smooth function with respect to a suitable coordinate system. In that situation, we can deform our region R into a flat region. Throughout this deformation, GB doesn't change, because if it did, it would do so continuously, but by step 2, we know it only could change by a multiple of 2 pi. This means that GB of the original region equals GB of the deformed region, which is flat. Then, by the hopf hufnlausatz this quantity is zero. This concludes the proof of step 3. The final step is done by combining step 3 with the additivity property. For any region R, we break it into small pieces so that each piece is contained in a portion of sigma where step 3 holds, and in such a way that we can recover R by assembling the pieces one by one in such a way that the additivity property holds. Notice that for this, we actually need the region R to be homeomorphic to a disk. In each piece, gb equals 0 by step 3, and then by the additivity property, gb of r equals 0. This finishes the proof of the gauss bonnet formula. A popular special case is when the region r is a triangle with geodesic sides. In that case, the geodesic curvature of its boundary is 3 pi minus the sum of its internal angles. After rearranging this expression, we get that the integral of the Gauss curvature over the triangle equals the sum of the internal angles of the triangle minus pi. This means that in a surface of positive curvature, the sum of the angles of a triangle is greater than 180 degrees, so the triangles are fatter than in the Euclidean plane. And similarly, in a surface of negative curvature, the sum of the angles of a triangle is less than 180 degrees, so the triangles are thinner than in the Euclidean plane. With the gauss bonnet formula, we can easily prove the gauss bonnet theorem. This theorem states that for a closed surface sigma, the integral of the Gauss curvature over sigma equals 2 pi times the Euler characteristic of sigma. Recall that the Euler characteristic is the quantity given by the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces we obtain when we triangulate the surface. To prove this theorem, we triangulate the surface and apply the gauss bonnet formula to each triangle. 
we then rearrange the terms and notice that the integral of k over the entire surface is the sum of the integrals of k over all triangles. In this expression, there is only one mysterious term, the one containing the total geodesic curvatures. We claim that this term equals 2 pi times e minus v. Notice that if this claim is true, we can finish the proof of the theorem by plugging it in the above expression, so we are left to prove this claim. The total geodesic curvatures of piecewise smooth curves contain contributions coming from the edges and contributions coming from the vertices or corners. However, in this sum, each edge of the triangulation is traveled once in each direction, so the contributions coming from this edge cancel each other. How about the vertices? Well, we now look at the contributions coming from a single vertex. All the counterclockwise rotation we see here is the sum of pi minus theta j, where the theta j's are the angles of the triangles at such vertex. Since the sum of the theta j's is 2 pi, this can be rewritten as pi times the number of faces adjacent to this vertex minus 2 pi. Summing these contributions over all vertices, we get 3 pi f minus 2 pi v. This is because each face contains exactly three vertices. Finally, since each face contains exactly three edges and each edge belongs to exactly two faces, 3f equals 2e, finishing the proof of the claim and the gauss bonnet theorem. This was a long lesson, but I hope you enjoyed it. Only one more to go and see you next time.